so uh, tell us real quickly um, who you are for those who haven't <laughs> done the research as well as our last guest has. Sure. So I'm Jeremy Nobel, and I'm a medical doctor, public health practitioner, and a poet, but also the founder of the Foundation for Art and Healing, whose mission is to explore and promote the idea that creative arts expression improves health and well-being mm -hmm. mm -hmm. for individuals and community, an idea that I think goes over pretty well in this audience, but yeah. still needs a lot of promotion in the outside world. Right. So we had three prompts to think about um, for this long table conversation. It's actually kind of a short, it's a little triangular table, but, um, and I just want to start on the, the first one on like, what are, what are some, what is, what are things we could do at the smallest level to think about the kinds of transformation that we want to be working towards? Yeah, I thought that was a great question. You know, often we're invited to think big. The E. Cummings quote, always, always the beautiful answer, where are the more beautiful questions, you know, and I think questions are, are small and the right question can kind of change the world. So thanks for asking that question. You know, I think it does go to the heart of what we've been involved in at the foundation for the last two or three years. And you brought it up in your last comments, which is really looking at loneliness and social isolation as a fundamental personal and public health issue. And so as you start unwinding that a little bit, it really gets to the heart of much of what's already been talked about today which is we are hardwired for connection. And when politics and society and culture remove us from ourselves and from other people, our health suffers. Yeah. And not only health you know, in our personal sense, although I'll talk a little bit more about that, mm -hmm. but in world health, our connection to others, our recognition of others, our ability to have empathy for others begins to deteriorate. Right. So when you talk about the small thing, mm -hmm. and I think the arts have a lot to do with it, the small thing I think all of us can do, and this is where the arts can help, is to be in the moment and pay more attention. I think it starts with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you brought up a quote that I was thinking about in, in these prompts, and you probably know E.O. Wilson, evolutionary biologist, biologist, and there's two things that he put his finger on this in this book, The You Social Conquest of Earth, that I think connects with, with all of this. One is that um, human beings, termites and ants are the three species and the only three species that by default will uh, sacrifice themselves for the, for the sake of the larger. Um, and that, that is a really interesting you know, thing. The other thing is that um, we've evolved in a way that we you know, have developed these Star Wars technologies, but we, we drive them with um, uh, Stone Age emotion. And you know, instantly you would think about weapons and laser guns and things like that, but information systems seems to be a Star Wars technology that we're slipping on like ice now. Um, and, um, you know, when when we think about how we've developed these social media platforms and, and how the whole journalism platforms are kind of reorganizing themselves, uh, it, it almost feels like we're losing a sense of connection to something that we used to understand and now we're trying to re rebuild it. And does that come into the work at all in terms of isolationism, in terms of the 21st century sort of social, social uh, platforms that we're operating on? No question it does. I mean, so digital connectivity, what, is, what does that really mean? 6,000 friends on Facebook, but who's bringing you lunch tomorrow if you're sick at home, right? So we have a growing sense that whatever that connection is digitally, it might be quite important. It isn't fully serving the needs we have or that society has talk about E.O. Wilson. He's a wonderful biologist. Um, he's at Harvard. I've, I've enjoyed being there on the faculty for a number of years also. And I think what he speaks to really goes back to or why we are so hardwired for connection. So let's go back 70,000 years and you hear a sound in the bushes and it, well, maybe that's a saber-toothed tiger, you know, and our brain is an organ for threat detection. We're on it. We're on it. We're on it. So you pick up a stick, right, saying, okay, i got to defend myself. Wouldn't you feel better if there are 10 people around you also picking up sticks? <laughs> yep. And I think it's as simple as that. And so right. as we wall ourselves away from other people who can help us, uh -huh. this, this biological phenomenon called fight or flight mm -hmm. or freeze goes into action. Mm -hmm. And so we're always, if we don't think anyone's got our back, if we think we're at risk and no one's there to help us, pick up a stick to defend us against a threat, mm -hmm. or help us survive in some way, our entire biology 
in a non-helpful way that increases blood pressure, reduces immune response, and so on, is turned up a little bit. Yep. Which actually leads to one of the real important observations of just over the last few years about how toxic stress, uh, stress related to loneliness and so social isolation actually is. Mm -hmm. Some very compelling epidemiology started coming out showing that loneliness had an increased risk of early death of 30%. Mm -hmm. Put that in perspective for the non-epidemiologists, <laughs> non-public health types, that's smoking. Yeah. And so the quote that is often used, it's put out by Julianne Holt Lundstedt, a phenomenal epidemiologist, that being lonely is like smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Mm -hmm. wow. And you think about how we look at other, how, how we look at smoking as a major public and personal health issue, mm -hmm. and then we look at loneliness as a mild mood disorder that you're going to get over, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you just you know, suck it up. Right. And so that, that's really kind of what's got attention really on the loneliness issue and opens up some important opportunities mm -hmm. for creative arts to be useful, mm -hmm. to form authentic and sustainable connection. And that's the right. heart of what right. the Unloneliness Project and your work too is promoting. Yeah, and I think uh, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about um, the, the real um, challenge there uh, is to see that there is potential for the arts to play a role, but also not to be lazy and think that all arts is going to cure that. Um, so if we think about how well you've been kind of honing in on, on, on that root problem and understanding what those issues are, uh, have you thought a little bit about, I'm sure you have, um, share your thoughts about what types of specific uh, responses or interventions could we be thinking about, about that would be a, a, uh, an, an effective way to aim our weapon at that? Yeah. So if the problem is loneliness and lack of connection, the solution is connection. So how do we achieve it? And how do we achieve it at scale, recognizing diversity, challenge, trauma, and all those things? Mm -hmm. And you said it earlier, and I think it's been the basis of a lot, a lot of the effective work in post-traumatic stress and so on, is let us figure out how to find, shape, and share our personal narratives, our personal stories. Right. And the arts are incredibly powerful for that whether you're a professional artist or not. Mm -hmm. It tends to break through the emotional barrier many of us have of guilt and shame about being vulnerable about recognizing and declaring our story. So you're just hitting on something that was, a, there's a bell. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna do my dance though. Um, <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, one of the things about having the privilege of doing this work with military folks coming in, everybody who does it, it's embedded in their team approach of integrative care. Uh, everybody who comes in gets it. Every, I mean, is given the thing, it's mandatory, uh, mask making and music therapy, et cetera. One of the things that really has changed my whole perception of who is an artist, why do they do it, and what, what do they get out of it? Um, and this, I think, goes back to Mr. Rubenstein's comments at the top in terms of how it's, you know, we, I have been conditioned to think of the art sector as being a certain tribe of people, really, over here. Um, and when you think about how the arts intersects with everybody. Right, so let me pick up on everybody because mm -hmm. a big focus of the Unlonely Project call to action is to take creative expression as a way to find and share your story mm -hmm. broadly away from the traditional centers of arts activities and into workplaces, college campuses, community centers for older adults. Mm -hmm. Draw on arts organizations for support, for help, for assistance. But bridge that and, gap. And capacity. Right, because mm -hmm. unless we normalize creative expression as a daily activity, mm -hmm. we're going to fall behind. Yep. And one of the things we were prompted to ask about in terms of how you, what does success look like and so on, so I thought about that. Mm -hmm. So how about if at some point when you go in to see your primary care physician, and in addition to asking about your diet and exercise, she asks you, is there a creative activity that matters to you? Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. Yep. Cool. I think, I think we'll end on the applause line. <laughs>